Yes, so I've moved from the teaching of the New Testament into the early church because of the issue of historical continuity, what the apostles laid down, the early church held to and practiced, but bit by bit you see them bringing in certain additions, claiming apostolic authority, but they're not in the New Testament. And I firmly believe that infant baptism was one of those additions. Uh, More about that as we proceed. So I won't be dealing this morning with the issue of infant baptism as such. The only other thing I mention is uh, some of the uh, books. I'd say probably the most comprehensive book that's been written in recent times and I'm not uh, recommending that you read it because it's an enormous tome of over 900 pages uh, called Baptism in the Early Church by Everett Ferguson. The reason I mention it is not only because he deals with the early church but he also deals with the Jewish background which I'll be dealing with in the first presentation this morning which I'll be starting shortly. But uh, (coughs) the interesting thing about this is that Everett Ferguson is an expert in patristic studies, that's the studies of the early church, the church fathers, hence it's called patristic after the uh, Greek term pater, uh, meaning uh, (coughs) patros, meaning father, the early church fathers, and Everett Ferguson is a Baptist. Now when it comes to the early church, something I've noticed over the years is that, as you would expect, the Roman Catholics, the Anglicans and the Greek Orthodox, the early church is their warp and woof. woof. They're saturated with it. On the Protestant side, Apart from Anglicans, the only Protestant uh, people, for the most part, there are exceptions, but the people that excel in the field, and Ferguson is one, are Baptists. Because they recognise that what the Church Fathers practised and taught is in line with their own beliefs on the subject. and uh, I'll be referring to that book. So without further ado, let's uh, proceed. Yep. We'll proceed. Uh, I'll be explaining what you're seeing there in the picture uh, shortly, but it's a Jewish... Uh, Ritual bath or mikveh or mikvah, the final vowel varies, and beside it is a reservoir. Uh, More about that as we proceed. So we're looking at the Christian baptism as the and the Jewish background. Now I'll have to keep moving because there's quite a lot to see, quite a lot to present. So I've got to keep the ball rolling. So it's the Jewish ritual bath or mikveh. Now, we start with the Old Testament and the, uh, <coughs> the references to purification water. And uh, you have reference in uh, Numbers, it's Numbers 8 verse 7 and Numbers 19 uh, verses 9 and 13 referring to the cleansing of the Levites. Thus you shall do to them for their cleansing. Sprinkle purifying water, the water of sin, literally, in the Hebrew. Sprinkle this purifying water on them. And then uh, in Numbers 19, it's the water of impurity, the water which cleanses from impurity. And... uh, For what purposes would this be done? Well, for one who touches a corpse, 
For the unclean person they shall take some of the ashes of the burnt purification from sin uh, and flowing water shall be added to them in a vessel. Flowing water or running water. That's from Numbers 19 and verse 17. And once they're cleansed, a clean person shall take hyssop and dip uh, the hyssop in the water and sprinkle it uh, upon the tent and on all furnishings. Now what is this water of sin? Well, Numbers 19 gives it quite clear uh, clear uh, instructions. A red heifer was to be slaughtered, burned, and its ash gathered for the water of impurity. And here's the important point to note. Mixed with water, the ash was a ready-made sin offering. It was a sin offering, as it were, on ice, so that you could just get it. You didn't have to go through all the rituals and procedures of a sacrifice. It was already done for you. You just had some of the uh, ash of the red heifer, mix it with, with water, and you can sprinkle that. But, notice... This was for bathing bathing of the body, plain water. This water of sin, this mixture of ash plus water, that was what was sprinkled. Not plain water. Let that point be clear. So, on the matter... Oops... Oops, there we go. On the matter of washing or bathing, there are two distinct Hebrew words. Kibes, kibes for washing, and rachatz for bathing. Now, kibes uh, was used for washing a garment, washing clothes. It was not used for washing the body. Unless anybody who knows a bit of Hebrew say, oh, in Psalm 51, uh, David prays to the Lord to wash me thoroughly and I shall be clean. Kibes. But he is comparing himself, he's likening himself to a, a dirty garment. And that's the uh, analogy that he's using. Let that be clear. So, kibes in the ritual law is for uh, washing garments or clothes. Rachatz is for bathing. And rachatz is, is, or refers to bathing the entire body. And so, rachatz is immersion. We can see this best in the ritual for cleansing of the leper. This is in Leviticus 14. The one to be cleansed shall then wash his clothes, kibes, and shave off his hair and bathe, rahats, in water and be clean. That's at the outset, and then seven days later, same procedure. And then in Leviticus 5 and verse 5, in case uh, you can't see it up the back there, I'll read it out. Leviticus 15, verse 5, Anyone who has had a discharge, anyone who touches his bed or the person, he shall wash his clothes, kibes, and bathe, rachatz, in water, and be clean until the evening. And the high priest had to do the same before the Day of Atonement procedure, Before he put on the holy garments, he shall bathe his body, rachatz, in water, then put on the garments. That's in Leviticus 16. And certainly the interpretation of the Jews in New Testament times and long prior to that was that this was an immersion rite, as we shall see. And Jesus endorsed these prevailing procedures 
as what Moses commanded. Remember the story of the ten lepers. He said, go and show yourself to the priests and let the priests do as Moses commanded. Uh, you have that there in Mark 1.44 and uh, the story of the ten lepers in Luke 17. However, in Hebrews 9, verse 13, and then 19 to 21, the sprinklings cited there are of blood. And here Exodus 24 is quoted. And the ash plus water mixture of Numbers 19. Now I make a point of this because you get pedo-baptists appealing to Hebrews, these Hebrews 9 references and say, saying, there, see, sprinkling. Hang on, what they, the reference there is to the Jewish procedure and it's ash plus water, not water on its own. So the extent and purpose of washing or bathing. The cleansing of the leper was two clean birds, one slain and its blood collected, the the other along with cedar, scarlet string and hyssop dipped in the blood and then sprinkled seven times over the one to be uh, cleansed. And Incidentally, there are two verbs in Hebrew that mean sprinkle. The one that is used for sprinkling blood really means more dabbing the end of the finger, dipping the tip of the finger and then dabbing it, say, on the altar or on the priest or whatever. The other one, zarak, is more uh, throwing it around and uh, strewing it around, more splashing motion. And appeal is made there, for instance, to Ezekiel uh, 36. I will sprinkle clean water. I had a great long argument with a pedo-baptist years ago who kept appealing to this passage. I didn't know it at the time. Then I looked it up later and, yeah, Zarak. It means to splash as somebody bringing along a, an infant for, for baptism, is it, uh, the parent going to put up with the idea of the, the, uh, the priest or the minister dipping his hands and splashing the baby like that? I don't think so. And anyway, I've got to prove that that passage has anything to do with baptism. But that's another issue. So coming back uh, to uh, Numbers Uh, 8 and Leviticus 14 and Numbers 19, we see two components. The sprinkling by the priest with the blood. Secondly, the requirement for the unclean candidate, that is washing of clothes and importantly bathing the body in water. The prescription for the leper, Leviticus 14, is also for the one who contacts a corpse And the purpose uh, is to identify and unite with the sprinkling of either blood or the ash plus water mixture. The idea is that the one to be cleansed uh, (coughs) bathes in water so as to identify with the uh, the, uh, sacrificial procedure. The unclean person, having been sprinkled with the water of purification and thereby cleansed and through the washing of his clothes and the shaving off of all his hair and the bathing of the whole body, he is renewed in the outer man and, as it were, newborn. I'm quoting there from a book uh, called Sacrificial Worship of the Old Testament, which was written in the 19th century. Now in the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, from 250 BC onwards, the word for bathing is luo. 
Now this is interesting, particularly when we come to the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, Luo refers to bathing the entire body. There's another word for, uh, for uh, washing. Uh, so uh, luo is either washing or bathing. There's another word for washing, that's nipto, and that is only ever used for uh, washing part of the body. Washing your face, washing your hands, washing your feet, that sort of thing. It is never used for washing the entire body. And there's yet another verb for washing in the Greek, pluno, which means to wash clothes. So that, dis that distinction, and all the researches I've done, is strictly observed. You never get nipto used for washing the entire body. You never get luo used for washing part of the body. And so here we go to the matter of the mikveh pool, the Jewish ritual bath. And the photographs you'll see coming up are, for the most part, my own when I visited the Herod's Palace near Jericho. We'll look at the location uh, just there. There's the old Jericho. Uh, the uh, uh, modern Jericho, uh, <coughs> which uh, is, it takes in the uh, ancient city of Jericho, Joshua's Jericho and all that. And then about three kilometres away, there's the Jericho of New Testament times, which was built by Herod the Great. And they're three kilometres apart. I went down to uh, Jericho uh, in a bus, but then I wanted to get out to Herod's palace. I managed to get a taxi. <laughs> uh, it was a bit far to walk, and it was a hot day. <laughs> so there's two Jerichos. There's the Herodian or New Testament period Jericho, about three k's from the modern town, and a little more, just a wee bit more, from the Old Testament Jericho. Uh, let's go there. Uh, just by the way here, Matthew 20 and Mark 10 have Jesus healing the blind man after leaving Jericho. In Luke, this is when he approached Jericho. Ah, contradiction, people say, contradiction, see, there it is. Hang on a minute. Matthew and Mark have him leaving the Old Testament Jericho. Luke had him approaching the Herodian Jericho. He's in between. And uh, the modern town is spread out a bit more than it was in New Testament times. Uh, so there was quite a bit of distance, but of course uh, back then everybody walked. So there's no conflict, two different Jerichos in point of fact, and uh, the, the Herodian Jericho uh, became the focal point of a new residential area. And quite a number of residential uh, houses grew up around the Herodian palace. So uh, there you've got a plan on the bottom left there of uh, the Herodian period Jericho. I won't go into all the details, uh, but uh, you've got the Hasmonean palace, that's the Jewish kings in the uh, second and first centuries BC. Uh, you've got uh, the first palace of Herod and the second palace of Herod and then the third palace of Herod. Uh, and that's just Jericho, he had palaces elsewhere, plenty of them. And uh, so you've got there uh, the main building, the Pools Complex, Twins Palaces, 
enclosed garden, the large pool, the residential area, and so on. Now, both the palaces and the residences had mikveh pools and an aqueduct for the water supply. They had to be an aqueduct because Jericho is in a rain shadow area. It hardly ever rains down there. But Herod saw to uh, things that there was, the water supply was plentiful. Likewise in Jerusalem, as we'll see. So here's a general view of the Herodian palace. Uh, <coughs> about three k's from the modern and the ancient town. Now the whole area is below sea level, a rain shadow region, as I mentioned. And uh, in the absence of running water, and running water was held to be ritually pure, the mikveh pool had associated, an associated altsar or reservoir uh, of pure water. The idea was that the uh, water in the mikveh would be regarded as impure and useless thereby, thereby for uh, ritual purposes, ritual purification, and to purify it you needed a reservoir of pure water. And here you can see the uh, plan. So on the left you have the mikveh with stairs going down. And then he would, the uh, person to be cleansed would immerse himself in that pool. Over here in the centre is the altar, and uh, in between there's a little channel or an open channel which connects the altar or reservoir with the mikveh. And so here is uh, one such mikveh at Herod's palace in Jericho, uh, originally excavated under the direction of Ehud Netzer during seasons 1973 to 78. Much of the plaster lining you'll see is still intact. And you'll see some other examples uh, <coughs> where you can see the watermark uh, from all those centuries ago. Now the idea was that the uh, person would go down the stairs on the left, immerse himself, and then come up on the right, or from his standpoint down below, he'd come again up on his left. But if he traversed the, uh, the steps where he'd come down, then he was held to be impure and he'd have to repeat the procedure. Now, here's another mikveh pool. Uh, <coughs> there you see the stairs, and uh, it's, uh, here is the connecting channel to the altar, which is out of the picture. And uh, uh, it's uh, certainly quite accommodating. Sometimes two people would go down at once, one after the other. And here uh, you can see the stairs face on. Uh, it has both the narrow staircase and the provisions, uh, provision for hot water since evidence of a copper urn and furnace were found in the adjoining wall. The installation was in part for visiting priests and religious personnel. Uh, there was a community of priests down at uh, Jericho that's the background, by the way, to the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, remember, the, uh, the priest kept his distance from what he thought was a dead body because if he got too close, he'd be ritually impure. And then likewise, the Levite comes along and he has the same attitude because he's got to go up and perform temple service, you see. So they don't come too close. And basically the parable is that Jesus is saying nuts to all that. <laughs> Here you see um, 
Again, the alts are at the top, the reservoir, connecting channel, and the stairs down into the mikvah. And the pl again, the plaster lining is still largely intact. Uh, <coughs> And uh, you do see uh, also the ancient watermarks. There's the channel. And this was part of the burial ground complex since according to Mosaic law, contact with the dead even near a cemetery brought defilement. And this is where Numbers 19 uh, came in. And incidentally, the Pharisees and the Sadducees differed uh, when I say differed, it got to blows at times, uh, over just how close you could go to a grave. The Pharisees said 50 metres in modern terms. The Sadducees said, well, you can come as close as 20 metres. And so they argued over that. And here's another example. Uh, the plaster is there and you can also see the uh, ancient uh, watermarks. The uh, staircase this time is a little bit wider, not so quite so narrow. Now here is a very interesting one and I'll explain why. It's got a double staircase. Now the idea is you went down one side and came up the other. Uh, when I was there, I saw all this grass and mess down in the bottom and I was tempted to uh, go and clear it but uh, I was told there are vipers around and I didn't want to take any risks. <laughs> so I left things alone but uh, uh, <coughs> we can see there the, the staircase Oh, sorry, with the mikvah with the staircase at each end to avoid the problem of recontraction of defilement. And this is one of three having the double staircase. And they were apart from the palace complex, possibly to facilitate a greater number of people, but also for use in proselyte baptism. By this time, the Jews were practicing proselyte baptism where the candidate would go down on one side, immerse himself under the supervision of a rabbi and then come up the other side. And that is exactly the pattern of the early church baptismal fonts that you see in early churches. And I've seen quite a few of them. Go, the candidate would go down one side, be immersed and come up the other side. The idea is that you go down, you leave your old life behind, you are buried with Christ in baptism and then you come up in newness of life. That was the early church practice. So much of what passes for baptisms today has nothing to do with it. A dab on the forehead or even a bit of a sprinkle like that has nothing to do with New Testament baptism or with Jewish proselyte baptism for that matter. Now this design from Hasmonean times uh, is uh, a Hasmonean period probably about 60 BC or earlier it anticipates, as I said, the baptismal fonts of early Christian centuries. And that's uh, uh, <coughs> as it appeared when it was first excavated. And now, when I saw it, it was overgrown with rubbish and probably infested with snakes, so I didn't want to take the risk, as I said. So the mikvah oath, that's the plural mikvah oath, were not bathtubs for personal toiletry, Herod, along with many wealthy Jews, had both. But they were at separate parts of the palace. There's a bathtub for toiletry use. Uh, <coughs> so the mikveh pools were for ritual purification. The bathtub was for normal washing. And... Uh, 
Then there was the bath complex. Uh, that was very much recreational bathing. You had uh, the hot, the tepid and the cold. Uh, and all of Herod's palaces uh, had those uh, as a standard installation. We don't want to uh, dwell on that. Now, except for uh, there is uh, one of the bath complexes. Uh, uh, that's the uh, Caldarium or Calidarium, uh, which would, uh, from which steam would flow into the uh, circular chamber. There'd be a floor over the top there and uh, people would sit in the alcove there over on the other side and the steam would flow out from underneath uh, the floor where you've got the, the hot water. Uh, <coughs> now where did all the water come from? Remember this palace was in a rain shadow area but Herod saw to it that much water was available. And there is the, or a part of the system of water channels and ducts uh, for the many mikveh pools and the ordinary baths and of course his recreational bath complex uh, again at the uh, uh, Herodian palace. So the purpose of the mikveh was temple worship uh, and following uh, text in Hebrews both gifts and sacrifices are offered which relate only to food, drink and various washings, baptisms. You notice it's the plural there because this sort of procedure was a daily thing sometimes two or three times a day, just depending where you'd been and what you'd done. Uh, <clears throat> that's what he's referring to. Hebrew, that text in Hebrew is referring to Jewish purifications which were immersion rites, but they are nothing to do with New Testament baptism, contrary to our pedo-baptist friends. So these baptisms were immersions in the mikveh and they connected the person with the sacrificial procedures in the temple. Now let's have a look at the mikveh and the gospels. Do the gospels refer to it? Yes they do. Jewish society was obsessed with ritual purity. There's a Pharisaic practice referred to in Mark 7 when they, that's the Pharisees, come from the marketplace they do not eat unless they baptise themselves and that's the Greek up there, baptisontai baptise themselves you see that's going down into the mikveh and immersing yourself in the mikveh for that matter Jewish homes today have one Orthodox Jews you go up to Balaclava or Caulfield, if you go into some Jewish homes, down in the basement you'll find a mikveh today. And there are many other things that they have received in order to observe, such as the baptising, baptismus, of cups and pitchers, yes, and even beds. Uh, it's interesting that uh, some of the manuscripts leave out the beds bit, but they did. They'd baptise a whole bedstead in a large mikveh. It part, was part of the procedure. Uh, now, Pharisaic practice two. When the Pharisee, this is from Luke 11, when the Pharisee saw, saw it, he was surprised that he, Jesus, had not first been baptised before the meal. They'd come in from outside, rubbing shoulders of Gentiles. And this Pharisee was horrified. Jesus, a rabbi, he doesn't go down to the mikveh and immerse himself. What's going on? 
He can't be a rabbi. <laughs> See, in Pharisaic thinking, defilement would be contracted outside in many and various ways. And the mikveh was the cleansing ritual. And then in John 2, there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing about 20 or 30 gallons each. These were for topping up the mikveh. And that's, uh, I've seen, uh, I don't have them here, but I've seen them in uh, uh, Jewish literature, uh, old woodcuts depicting uh, someone immersing a bed and someone uh, using very large water pot for, and pouring it into the mikveh to top it up. And that's what they were there for. And so you have these mikveh pools in Jerusalem. And uh, here's uh, the southern corner of the Temple Mount. And uh, uh, <coughs> It features Robinson's Arch, or what's left of it, and the remains of shops and other buildings in the foreground. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, this uh, area around the temple. Every Jewish home and hostel was fitted with a mikveh pool. And this plaque here uh, uh, explains an excavated house or hostel containing several such pools. Why a hostel? Why several in one house? Well, at festival times, Jewish people would open their homes to accommodate pilgrims who came from far and wide. The Ethiopian eunuch was one such person in that date. So possibly the house was for pilgrims, as I said. Now Jesus at this home of the Pharisee, let's go back to that for a moment. And the Pharisee sought, he was surprised, etc. We saw that. A Pharisaic Jew, after entering his home from the defilements outside, the procedure was cleansing, for cleansing was to immerse in his domestic mikveh pool. And this is the background to Luke 11, 38. Every home, both poor and wealthy, are my especially the poor, had such a pool. and They were used on a daily basis. And here in uh, the Jewish quarter has been excavated a, a wealthy home and here in the picture is a mikveh pool. Again, the, some of the plaster is still intact. Around the walls were... Uh, quite severe burn marks from when the house was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. And so uh, <coughs> this house dates from the Herodian period. Now just up in the top left there you see a bathtub for toiletry purposes but the mikveh pool is uh, there in the foreground and that was a standard installation. Now here's uh, part of a poorer home uh, showing a mikveh in the foreground below in the centre, just there. And in the, uh, this is your mikveh just here and up there in the uh, rectangle is your otsar which uh, uh, purifies the impure water, so they believed. A less well-preserved mikveh here. Uh, <coughs> the adjacent to the previous uh, example in the previous frame, the plaster is still intact on one wall. Both of these examples belong to the poorer classes. So there's the uh, stair stairway down into the mikveh 
uh, in the uh, rectangle. Now the main installations on the main installation rather on the southern staircase called the Huldar staircase on the temple to the temple was the ritual bathhouse where all the worshippers had to bathe before entering the temple. And two mikveh pools, one for men, one for women. And uh, <coughs> this view shows the one for the men. And that's it side on. That's it, face on. These are my photographs, by the way. And so the candidate would descend that way and then go immerse himself at the bottom and then go up the other side. You notice a little divider there. And again, the main purpose of this mikveh was to identify with the sacrificial ritual of the temple but he must be ritually pure before he could even enter the temple. Here's a uh, two-chamber mikveh where he'd go in on the left and come out on the right. Uh, <coughs> again, from the temple area. And this example was probably part of a private home. And inside, now we've got it inside, uh, much ancient debris was found in all of these pools, including quite a bit of Roman glass, now on display in Jerusalem museums. There are several of them. And all that one finds here now is uh, a Coca-Cola can. At least that's what was there when I took the picture. And here are the water supply cisterns uh, that uh, conveyed water to the houses as well as to the uh, temple installations. A much larger one, of course, supplied the temple uh, and that lies under the temple mount. Now, the water ultimately came from Herod's pools down south of Bethlehem, misnamed Solomon's pools, uh, <coughs> and uh, conveyed by aqueduct to Jerusalem. And Herod's aqueduct was so well constructed it was used throughout the Middle Ages and even during the Turkish period until the Turks were driven out in 1917. There's a modern uh, uh, substitute these days. Now all of this is to confirm that baptise means immerse. It means only immerse. It cannot mean anything other than immerse there is a completely different Greek verb for sprinkle. The two do never overlap with each other in meaning or use. I'll be absolutely dogmatic on that. Now let's have a look at John's baptism, just to wrap things up. I'm sorry if I've kept you, but... Uh, John the baptizer now appears on the Jewish scene. He had already been in the wilderness of Judea for some years. How long, we don't know. Probably from boyhood or at least teenage years. Uh, and at the appropriate time, he began to preach and baptize. Now, these are not my photographs. Uh, these are off the public domain, but still... Uh, that is the traditional place where John baptised uh, just north of the Dead Sea, the traditional site of Bethany beyond Jordan. Uh, people come from America in particular to be baptised there. I wouldn't want to be baptised there. It's a mud hole. <laughs> but John preached a baptism of repentance, a twofold purpose. One, to purify a people in preparation for the coming of Messiah. And he used the mikveh to do that, but with a difference, as I'll explain. And two, it was to herald a transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. Let that point be very clear. 
John and in his preaching, his baptizing, and the followers who uh, received his baptism, for them John was a transitional figure, likewise with our Lord. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He had a, one foot in the Old Covenant and the other foot almost in the New. Not quite. Now under the Old Covenant, membership was by natural birth, circumcision and observance of the Torah, the law of Moses. But under the New Covenant, there must be repentance, faith in the Messiah and the law written on the heart. And here's the, old, the, the essential point. Remember when, and it's in Mark chapter 2, when some of John's disciples came to Jesus uh, <coughs> uh, along with our Lord's own disciples and said, why do John's disciples fast? And the Pharisees, for their part, fast as well. And Jesus gives this rather cryptic reply about an old, a new patch on an old garment and new wine in an old skin. Basically he's saying that the fasting bit and all that it represents belongs to the old covenant. I'm not here to patch up the old covenant. The new covenant will not be a patched up version of the old. What do you do with an old garment? You throw it away. What do you do with an old wineskin? You throw it away. With Christ, the new has come. And so John's baptism in a Jewish, a Jewish context, the mikveh had already been used for proselyte baptism, as I mentioned earlier on. And John employed this familiar immersion procedure for the purpose of his own ministry. One, to purify a people and prepare a people for the coming of Messiah and to inaugurate his penitence into a messianic movement. And he baptised in the Jordan. Why? Well, it was where the Israelites came into Canaan. And this was the second exodus as the prophet Isaiah indicates in chapter 40. And also here was running water. This uh, fiction of the Otsar, pure water purifying the impure water. If you read Haggai chapter 2, uh, that's not correct. Or in modern terms, you can catch a disease but you can't catch good health. Uh, and so the uh, Mosaic law prescribed running water. Here in the Jordan was running water, as you see in the picture. And then later on he moved further north to a place called Enon. It's not there today, but some, uh, a uh, place very similar to it is there today. It's called Gan Hashelishah. Uh, <coughs> It's near where Enon was in New Testament times and the water was plentiful there. Uh, <coughs> and here today people come both for recreation and people for baptism because they want to be baptised in the Jordan, you know, and all that. Now, in John chapter 3, you have notice of a discussion or possibly an argument on the part of John's disciples with a certain Jew about purification. You now see the background here. Purification, the mikveh pool. And then in the next verse they came to John complaining, look, Jesus is baptising and all are coming to him. What's going on? We learn here that purification and baptism were for the Jews generally and John's disciples in particular, convertible terms. are both interchangeable. Well then, what was the means of purification? Well, 
the mikveh pool, the well-known and frequently used ritual bath, the procedure of which John had adopted for his baptism, as all was already the case and had been for quite a long time for proselytes. And uh, as we saw, one of the many mikvahs at Herod's place, uh, palace near Jericho, and uh, I could show you pictures at Qumran, and John's place of ministry wasn't far from there. He pro- obviously knew, would have known they were there, uh, although there, any connection is, uh, should be ruled out, I think. And so John's disciples, despite believe, uh, being in the Jordan River, that is John's baptism, were thinking about a mikveh. Now, here is one very important but overlooked anecdote in this whole episode. On the subject of John's baptism, this overlooked passage in this whole discussion gives insight into Christ's own practice, which followed on from that of John, namely John 4, 1 and 2, which reads, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptising, now where do we read that kind of association? In the Great Commission, don't we? More about that a bit further on. Making and baptising more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptise, but only his disciples. This indicates clearly that Jesus adopted John's baptism as his own. Albeit that now it was not only repentance, but faith in him as the Messiah. Why? Because John had proclaimed him and designated him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. From that point on, John's baptism was essentially at least in principle, over. Jesus took over. John had proclaimed that Messiah was coming and then when Christ appeared, he declared him as the Lamb of God and thereafter it was a case of he must increase, I must decrease. I just fade away like an old soldier. And so Jesus' own practice was a direct continuation from that of John and in turn anticipated his own command in the Great Commission. And hence we may trace a direct line of continuity. The Jewish mikveh, John's baptism, Christ's baptism and the Great Commission. And so John, as a faithful Jew, but also a messianic prophet, derived his baptism from the the existing practice of proselyte baptism in the the mikveh. Now, to become a proselyte, one had to, first of all, confess the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. He had to undergo circumcision. And thirdly, immerse in the mikveh. And those requirements still apply to Jewish proselytes today. Now, here's the point. Circumcision was not available for women, naturally. (laughs) And so the third aspect, immersion, consequently assumed crucial significance. Now, Lawrence Schiffman from a Jewish perspective, concludes as follows about John's baptism, or rather Jewish proselyte baptism. This was a uh, book that uh, I obtained in a Jewish bookshop in Jerusalem, uh, Qatar Publishing House, it's a Jewish publisher. I would imagine that not many people are aware of this book, but I snapped it up when I saw it there in a Jewish bookshop. And here is a very important quotation. Quote, What can now be said about the evidence 
for the dating of immersion as a requirement for conversion, that is to Judaism. First, it seems it is necessary to date it before the time of John the Baptist and the rise of Christianity in order to understand the background against which baptism comes to the fore. Second, Canaitic evidence. That's the period between the destruction of the temple and AD 200. I don't want to go into any more of that. Although admittedly lacking early attestation, also lends support to the claim that immersion was already a necessary requirement for conversion in the late Second Temple times. Now Schiffman is a Jew, and naturally he has no interest in the Baptist, pedo-Baptist argument within Christianity. And so he has a neutral position which is all the more important. No axe to grind or anything like that either way. There's one point of difference, however, between Jewish proselyte baptism and that of John. Namely, the former was self-performed, albeit under the supervision of a rabbi. The latter was performed by John, as indicated in Matthew 3. So, let's summarise our observations. The mikveh or ritual bath has its origin, at least in intertestamental times, but it traces back to the Mosaic legislation for ritual purity and became a regular, formalised institution, particularly with the rise of the Pharisees in the 2nd century BC. The mikveh became a standard installation in every Jewish household. Ritual purification became the standard procedure for every devout Jew. This is how we should understand Mark 7 verse 4, Luke 11 38 and John 2 verse 6 as I mentioned. Immersion in the mikveh was understood as identification with the sacrifices carried out in the temple. Now it's important to see that in connection with Christian baptism. John preached repentance and baptised people accordingly to purify them for the coming of Messiah. To signify repentance and have penitence confirm this he adopted the purification rite of the mikveh. However, John avoided the Pharisaic casuistry of the Otsar or reservoir of pure and purifying water, and so he baptised at the Jordan, then later at Enon, where proper running water was plentiful, according to proper interpretation of the Mosaic law. 